Okay, good morning everyone. So I wanted to start today with a, a, a kind of starting a problem. It's, it's, it's a problem from your homework that's due on Wednesday, but this problem is actually the one that says uh, something to the fact of you don't need to turn this in, it won't be quiz, it's just for kicks. So I wanted to go through that because it's, it's a little bit more difficult than all the other ones, and so I wanted to kind of show or give the basic idea of, of how you would solve it as kind of an exercise to help understand the material a little bit better to get you started on the problem, and then hopefully everyone can then finish it from there, and then uh, if they don't get it, they can also then look at solutions when they're posted so you get a sense. So, so to give you a sense of what the problem is, it's from the... From the book from uh, Rizzoni. So, okay, right here. Okay, so it is 18.34, which you see right here. And so this looks a lot like how um, solenoids, a lot of solenoids are, are designed. Okay, so there's a question, I don't know, maybe three days ago or, so, or three classes ago, two classes ago, I'm not sure exactly when, about, um, okay, so you can. Basically, if you have a coil and you have a, some sort of ferrous material, you can drive a solenoid one in one direction with a current going through the coil, but how would you ever get the solenoid to move back in the other direction? That's essentially what the question was. And so the answer was, well, most solenoids actually have a spring attached to them. Okay, so you, <clears throat> you uh, basically move the, the ferrous material with the, the action of the solenoid, and then you... In doing that, you store potential energy in that spring, and then once you release the current, or it stops any current, the solenoid deactivates, and then it returns to its neutral position with the spring. Right? So that's how a lot of them work. And so what we have in this example right here is uh, you have a fixed structure here, a moving structure here, and then this is attached to a string, and a spring, and then these um, diagonal lines denote being attached to some sort of fixed structure. So this is a little bit misleading. This can slide along this bottom interface here. So the problem says, uh, this relay circuit shown below has the following parameters, and it has some numbers. We're just going to use the symbolic form of this for the, the purpose of solving this. Uh, spring constants, it has resistance of this coil, and then it asks, what is the minimum DC supply voltage for which this relay will make contact when the electrical switch is closed? Right, so if we close the switch, say for instance you have um, some sort of uh, electrical switch, such as a relay controlling this other relay, or you have an actual physical switch, looks like a light switch, you can then cause this voltage supply to then send current through the circuit, then actuate this part. Okay. And so, um, so some things to consider here. It asks for what is the minimum DC supply voltage. Okay, so it doesn't ask you how much voltage must you apply to keep this held against here. And we'll see as we get to the equations that actually as the distance here, x is equal to zero, if x goes to zero, uh, theoretically, with the assumption we made in this class, the force goes to infinity, which is obviously not practical. That doesn't actually happen, but if we make some of the assumptions we've done in class, that is what the math tells us, right? So it doesn't go to infinity, but we say that the force gets really, really hot. And so I don't know if anyone's ever tried to um, have a solar that's fully engaged and try to remove it by hand. It is not easy. I'll just say that. Okay, Depend especially if you have a sizable solenoid. Okay. So as this distance gets really small, the force increases considerably. And so what it's asking actually is at what voltage does this... Uh, movable part moves so much that the force increases and all of a sudden you see this snapping of this movable part into the solid part where obviously when it hits this then the force from the interaction is very high as well and it stops it from moving. Okay, that's, that's the question. Does anyone have any questions on the question statement? Okay. All right. um, neglect the iron reluctance. When it says neglect the iron reluctance that means that the permittivity our permeability of the iron material is uh, infinite, extremely high, so you don't have to consider reluctance in that case. Okay. So I've just added a sheet to uh, lecture four here. 
is just kind of a side problem. So what we have, just to draw this again, we have the structure. All right. This is the space of the of the unmoving structure as x, x is equal to zero. And then we have a moving structure, a movable structure, which is attached to a spring, which is then attached to something solid. And the neutral position of this is that x is equal to L. Okay, so as x decreases, the displacement increases system. This is attached to some sort of wall or something really solid. And then we have the ability to then put a voltage across this coil or in the same sense run a current across this coil by how the system was designed. So this would be V. This is R, this is electrical resistance. Do not confuse this with reluctance, which we'll talk about in a second. All right, any questions on the, the statement? All right, and it's spring constant, forget about that. Okay, so just like the other problems, where are we gonna start with this problem, do you think? Yes? Uh, Okay, we can we can do that. Uh, this is a little bit different than the one we've done before because we usually had a uh, current specified. But if we look at this electrical circuit, um, this one's the electrical circuit's essentially drawn for us. So we have the relationship that V is equal to IR. That's coming from uh, Ohm's law, right? Standard Ohm's law from the electrical circuits class. And so ultimately, just <coughs> by looking at what we did on Friday, we know that we are going to. We're going to care about current running through this coil, but that's going to be our that's going to directly influence our magnetomotive force. Right. So we would want to then solve for current. That's V over R. Okay. What next to that move we want to do? I'm going to decide the cards. Yeah, so let's, let's, exactly. So we're going to create an equivalent circuit diagram for this magnetic circuit. So the problem statement says that the permeability of this iron material is infinity, and that's going to hold for this material and this material. So what this is saying is that the permeability, or the permeability is so high here that the reluctance is, is going to be so small that we're going to say we are not going to consider that. And the reluctance is going to be dominated by the air gap. All right. So this location, if we have flux going, so it's going to be in this area and this area. And they're going to have extremely low reluctance everywhere else. Okay. And so in terms of an equivalent circuit, we have a magnetomotive force coming from the coil. Remember, this is given by N I, where N is the number of turns of this coil. And then we have the reluctance associated with the top air gap, reluctance associated with the bottom air gap, and then we have the flux running through the magnetic circuit. Um, and the other important thing to consider here is that this reluctance is a function of x, which we're going to describe in a second. Okay. All right, everyone good here? Any questions on this? Okay. All right, so reluctance, uh, we said in previous lectures that the reluctance is equal to the length of the path. All right, so I'll just write this as L in a second. We'll fill in this and give it a little bit more substance in a second over the permeability of free space times the area 
of that path. And so I think the, the problem statement gives us more specifics, but let's just say that this cross-sectional area is equal to A, just to make our lives easy so we don't have more variables than we need. Um, so we're going to have this expression. Now we need to come up with an expression for the length of this path. And so if we want to write this in terms of the variable at x, right, we say that at the neutral position, x is equal to L. Right? This is when the spring is not stretched. Right? As the spring um, stretches, then, this, then this, uh, this distance changes. So if we want to look at it and say, all right, what is the measure of the size of this air gap? x is measured in this direction. So it's just x, right? That's the length of our area. Given how the problem is stated, right? So we could also change the problem statement and say our x is in the other direction, and everything would work out as long as we did everything correctly, but that's that's how this problem is stated. Okay, so if we want to then look at what's the total reluctance of the circuit. These reluctances are in series, so we have then 2x two, two over mu a. And then we can figure out what phi is. Phi is going to be equal to, uh, given Ohm's law, it's going to be equal to f over the reluctance total, which is going to give us ni mu not a over 2x. Okay, any questions about this so far? Okay. All right, so this describes most of the magnetic circuit. Now, if we're talking about what is the minimum voltage required for um, this moving part to, to ever come in contact with the, the fixed part, what we're really talking about is, is the magnetic force stronger than the spring force, right? That's what we're trying to say, right? At what point does the magnetic force become stronger than the spring force? And then we'll also talk about some of the more, you, I, hope, I hope you'll see this in a second, it's gonna get a little more complicated than that, but at first glance, we're looking at a force balance on this moving. Determine whether or not it's going to move to the left or to the right. So, if we're looking at a force balance, we first have to know. Um, I guess we can start with a free body diagram, or we can start with the force on this from the magnetic force. But let's just look at this moving piece. Uh, we're not considering dynamics of this, but we have some sort of body. We have two competing forces. So, we have a spring force, which for x's that are that are smaller than L are going to pull this moving piece to the left. And we're going to have a force from the magnetic circuit that's always going to pull this uh, to the left. Did I say to the right or the left of the spring? To the left? OK, I was incorrect. To the right. Okay. I hope everyone sees that. If we move this moving body such that x is less than l, that means it's displacing to the left. That means that the force is going to be to the right. Right, that stretch the spring. Okay. So I have the force magnetic, which is coming from the magnetic circuit, always to the left, regardless of the voltage. Uh, as long as it's non-zero, so it's going to be to the left. Right? And then I have a spring force to the right. The spring force is going to be L. Minus x. So just to do this as a, as a kind of a thought study, if I were to plug in x is equal to L, which is the neutral position, I would get a force of zero, right? L minus L is zero. And if I were to have an x that is less than L, I'm going to have a positive spring force, right? 
if I were to somehow push this um, this moving member such so I'm compressing the spring, then this is going to become a negative spring force because x is going to be greater than f. Right? So everything checks out. So from Friday's class, we talked about what is the force that comes from a solenoid or some sort of moving uh, iron uh, transducer. And we said that this force, magnetic, is equal to negative 1 half V squared D R D X. So then we can start to plug in things here. So we have um, yeah. so then we have negative one half. V is given here, so this is gonna be n squared, i squared, mu naught squared, a squared over four x squared dr, dx, this one's a little easier. And just to, to note the difference between this one and the example we did on Friday. And the one on Friday, we were changing the, the way in which that moving iron moved. It changed the overlap in the area. Right? So in that case, we had this uh, moving iron that inserted itself more into the solenoid. The, the overlap of the area in terms of overlap of this path for the magnetic flux changed. Here, we actually have a shortening of that path, even though the area stays constant. So this is just a difference in how the system is designed. Right? And so instead of having this x term in the denominator, like the previous case, we have x in the numerator. This makes uh, differentiation a little bit easier. So if I look at what is d r t dx, let me make sure this is clear. This is the total reluctance. This is just going to be 2 over mu naught Uh, the problem statement did not say so, so we're going to say maybe not. Yeah, so. All right, so then we can start to cancel things out. Okay, those twos go away. Uh, one of these mu naughts go away. One of these a's go away. So we have negative, and I'll, we'll talk about the negative in a second. Negative n squared i squared mu naught a over 4x squared. Okay. All right, so let's talk about this negative sign here. So x is defined as going to the right, as specified by the problem. Um, and we get a force that is negative. And so that means that the force is to the left. Okay. Um, alternatively, we discussed on Friday that a, a magnetic circuit like this or a moving iron transducer is always going to try and minimize the reluctance in the system. Right? So reluctance here, um, if, if this air gap decreases, the reluctance gets smaller. Right? And so that's why we think of solenoids, et cetera, they're always pulling. Right? They're either trying to bring uh, two faces closer to each other or they're trying to insert one magnetic structure into the other. That's the, the main action that they have. And so we have force to the left here. Um, and that's de denoted by the negative sign of this equation. Right. Um, also, we I talked about theoretically that the force goes to infinity as x goes to 0. Obviously, that's not, that's not exactly true. But the x to this x squared in the denominator basically means that the force of the system gets, or the magnetic system gets really strong as this space gets close here, right? So if we wanted to say, all right, what, what current or voltage is required to hold, say we have this space touching the, the, the solid structure, what current or voltage is required to hold it in this position, it's basically any voltage above zero, right? Because that then triggers this uh, current, I guess I could, in, implant uh, v squared and r squared in here. 
um, that a trigger is in the current to flow, and then we're going to have some sort of infinite force holding this to the left, right? But the question asks, what is the minimum voltage required for to move this moving iron structure so that it does eventually touch this? All right, so X is going to be some sort of non-zero number. It's going to be between zero and L. And we need to figure out what that distance is, and also we have to figure out what is the voltage required to achieve that distance. So let me let me insert uh, V over R into uh, I here. So then we have a force balance here. So we have uh, two competing forces. If we say that X is to the right, our force balance is so sum of forces in the X direction is equal to K L minus X minus N squared V squared U naught A over four R squared X squared, and if we're looking at a force balance, we're not including dynamics, we're going to say this is equal to zero, right? And we want to understand what, at what voltage is this rate of cusp where it goes from being static, not moving to now, all of a sudden slams into the other side, right? That's what we're trying to understand with this force balance. Okay. So if we were to solve for X, here, there would be three solutions. All right. So we need to we need to tease out which of these three solutions is the correct one. Okay, because we if we say, for instance, multiply both uh, top and bottom here are both sides by x squared, get rid of this x squared in the denominator. We're getting x to the third term here, and so that's going to be a polynomial with three solutions, in it, right? Which is not going to be so easy to solve. Well, we can throw in a computer. Um, but also, it's, it's not going to be uh, very helpful either, because we need to figure out which of these solutions is the correct one. So I think it's it's and this was this is what makes this problem difficult. So let's talk about how we approach this then. Oops, that's not where I wanted to insert that. That's not what I want to do either. Okay. okay, so looking at these two equations, we have a force balance. And so one way to look at this force balance is we want to look at what is the contribution from a spring force and what is the contribution from uh, this magnetic force? So I'm going to plot this a little bit in reverse because I, I, I hope this is going to make a little bit more sense in a second. But I'm going to plot this in terms of what is... L minus X, which is a little bit backwards, but I, I hope this will make sense, especially when we're talking about the spring force. Okay, so if we look at the spring force, um, this is a linear spring, or assumed to be a linear spring, and so everyone has probably seen this a, a, quite a few times before, but a linear spring is going to have a force profile that is linear with slope K. This is just F in Newton. All right, so if we look at then this equation, this is a slightly different form. 
Um, and we'll, t we'll talk about this looks like in a second, but let's take a, a, I guess a look at when L, when X tends to, um, when X tends to the position of zero. Right? And so this is, say for instance, X is equal to zero. For any non-zero voltage put into the system, we're going to have a, a force that goes off to infinity. All right, and it's going to do so in an asymptotic fashion. Or, yeah, asymptotic fashion. All right. If we look as um, L minus X tends to zero, so this is not stretched, this is going to be some sort of, the spring is not stretched, it's going to be some sort of non-zero force that's applied. And so going back to our, our problem statements, which is actually a different document, Okay, so in the case where X is equal to L, that just means we have some sort of magnetic force on this moving, movable part, and it's going to be some sort of non-zero. It's going to be pulling to the left. Okay, so that represents, say for instance, uh, L minus X is equal to zero. That's where we start off, some sort of force that pulls to the left. It's some non-zero number for non-zero V. And it's going to now have two intersection points, this plot. Right? So that is locations in X at which this equality is true. Okay. Now, these two intersection points, um, let's, let's, let's first let's label this as a level set of V. So this is V, and I'll talk about this in a second, this is V is less than V threshold. Okay, so V is, V threshold is the, the voltage that we're trying to find. The problem statement says find the voltage required so that this movable part basically can contact, the minimum voltage required for this moving part to contact the stationary part, right? All right, so for V less than V threshold, we have two equilibrium points, one is uh, not really applicable, or we'll call it unstable equilibrium point, and the other one is a stable equilibrium point. So looking at this case, um, we have the case of, this is our stable equilibrium point. All right, so we have a constant voltage, and let's consider two scenarios. So let's consider the scenario of um, one that L minus X, and you can think of L minus X as how much the spring has stretched, is too small. So that means the magnetic force is stronger than the spring force. That means the moving part is going to move to the left. Right? The magnetic force is stronger than the spring force. Until we get to a point at which now we're actually at the equilibrium point, if I were to then move the the moving part farther to the left, that means that the spring force is stronger than the magnetic force, and it's going to then move to the right. Okay, so this is the stable point. If I were to, like, say we have the solenoid connected, I had a voltage applied to it, and I were to go in with my hand and try and move this moving part, it's going to always be driven back to this equilibrium point if I let go. Right? So if I push it to the left with my finger, it's going to move to the right. If I push it to the right with my finger, it's going to move to the left. Right? As long as I don't push it too hard. Okay. Is that, any questions about that idea? <coughs> this other equilibrium point is an unstable equilibrium point. If I were to, in this case, uh, I guess push it to the left, that means L minus X becomes larger than this equilibrium point. It's actually going to um, slam into the location. And so this is only quasi, this is a, a, an unstable equilibrium point. So this works theoretically, but it wouldn't work in practice. Now, as I increase voltage, voltage is the numerator. This level set here is just going to move up. So this is V increases. All right. And so if I were to look at the system with a spring in it, 
the moving part will be moving to the left, but it's not going to all of a sudden spontaneously crash into the other side. It's going to move a little bit farther to the left until I get to a threshold voltage at which these plots just lightly kiss at one single location. And so we have an equilibrium point here. And this is V is equal to V thresh. And this is what we're ultimately looking at. All right. We're looking at all right, how far does this displace? This is X threshold. And this happens at V threshold. Okay, so this is the, this is really what we care about when the voltage hits this, this level. And this is the last point at which we can possibly have this equation to ever be true. Okay, this is the last point at which these will equal each other because if I increase the voltage even more, say V greater than V thresh, you see that these plots no longer intersect anymore. They're never going to intersect. Okay, so then this equilibrium point can never be true. This is actually voltage above the threshold voltage that's going to crash into the fixed structure, and uh, to get it to move back, you have to take the voltage all the way down to zero. Okay. Any questions about that idea? Okay. All right. So this is this is kind of the whole schematic of what's going on. How do I find that point? What aspects of this plot may be helpful for me to find that point? I actually have that up front. What is it, uh, Thomas? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we have, we can take, if you look at these two plots, when these just barely kiss, they are both coincident and that you have the same force, right, at that uh, location. And also, if you look at the derivative with x, right, this is. Um, our independent axis is in the variable x. The derivative with respect to x is the same as well, right? So that we have both the position in terms of force and the, sorry, it's the force and the slope of that force with respect to x is equal. Right? And so, whereas before we have this third-order polynomial, which we had three solutions, this is going to help take down the number of solutions for us because we can write a we can write an equation in terms of the derivatives as well. So we're going to have this equation, sum of, sum of forces in x is equal to 0. That's going to still stand. And I'm also going to have that the derivative of the sum of forces in x with respect to x is equal to 0 as well. So that's going to give me then negative k. Plus, because we have x to the negative 2 for this equation here, plus 2n squared b squared mu naught a over 4 r squared x to the third is equal to 0. So this is still a third order polynomial, but it's instead of having what would end up being a third order term and then a second order term here when I multiply both sides by x squared. Um, I'm going to have something that is just x to the third term and also x to the zero term in the solution. Yes? Um, so, like, the x solution is one, it's interesting the other two x solutions. Could you also apply to all three x solutions and then, like, take the one from the middle? Uh, you have, you have two of them. Yeah, you have you have two of them. So we're going to have for this case, we're going to have this one and uh, this one, and then uh, I, I guess yes, <laughs> and you know as, as you say it. So this is going to happen. This is going to happen when the two equilibrium points, both the stable and the unstable one, converge to a single point. So you could find that point as well. Okay. You'd have to have a computer to do that. Yeah. So symbolically. 
third order polynomials, uh, solutions of third order polynomials will take you, uh, it would take us to the afternoon, I guess. <laughs> Has anyone ever seen like the Wikipedia page on how to solve a third order polynomial? Okay. It's, <laughs> it would take us a while. <laughs> So, so what we're going to we're going to do here is uh, with these two equations, you can actually solve for this. I'm going to move on to the new material, but I wanted to basically uh, start this. So you you basically, if you wanted to do this problem, you would you have two unknowns still, but you have two equations. So you still have an unknown in x, and you still have an unknown in v. Um, you can separate. You can start to insert or solve for v in one of these to figure out what x is, and then once you have x, you can solve for v. Yes, Sierra. So the uh, so the statement says, what is the minimum DC voltage supply for which the relay will make contact? Yes. So to stay in contact. If, say, for instance, it's to stay would say imply that it's already made contact, right? And then it's actually anything greater than zero would keep it in contact, given the equation. But this is actually what's the minimum voltage required for this to make contact? If you're assuming it's starting as x equal to L, how much do I, do I have to increase the voltage for me to get over this threshold voltage where it now crashes into the left hand side? Does that, does that make sense? Or do you need clarification? So it's going to be in terms of locations. I don't have like the pen. I guess do the pen abilities in this one. Uh, so it's going to be in terms of this, this schematic. It's going to be some voltage that draws this moving part to be somewhere to the left of this. All right, just by the left. And for those of you who want. And the answer, this, this distance is actually going to be, the distance has to move is L over 3. So this is a commonly known, um, uh, electromechanical machines, it's, 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 it's always known that the distance before this crashes over is actually always L over 3, regardless of the spring constant, actually. I, was there another question I saw in the corner of my eye or not? Making things up. Okay. Yes. Those are your two equations. Yeah. And now we can solve for x and we can solve for v. And by substituting in the, the, into each other, you'll see a lot of complicating factors will cancel out. Yes. Depends how the problem statement is posed, but yeah. Um, yeah, so solenoids, it's always, the distance is L over 3 for spring, spring-loaded solenoids. Yeah, that's always the answer. Um, for, I guess, I don't know if it's always the answer. For simple architectures of solenoids, it's always L over 3. Okay. So that was a little aside, just to give you more practice with moving iron transducers. Uh, in the remaining amount of this class, we're going to start an introduction on uh, moving coil transducers. So this is going to be lecture five. Okay, so what I have in front of me right here is your standard speaker, right? Everyone should have seen one of these before, or at least heard, of, heard what's happening from a speaker. Um, 
So some, some kind of, we're talking about, just like we did with removing iron transducer or the solenoid, we're going to come up with some observations of what's going on here. So some observations, we'll pass this around. I don't know if it's going to make its way through the entire class in the last 13 minutes or so. So I'll bring this in on Wednesday as well so everyone gets a chance to see it. But some observations of the system. Pull off the notes here. Uh, first is that this thing has a pretty large permanent magnet in it. So you can probably uh, probably some metal on your chair or something like that, you can try that out. But this big base, and that's also the reason why this thing is so heavy, is it has a big permanent magnet. Right. Yeah, so first observation, observation number one. This is large permanent magnet at the base. Okay, so observation number two. This observation is not so easy to see. My, I had Another speaker coil before that was also equally as junky as this, but actually a little more junky. And then you can actually see the coil that's been covered up by something. So I don't know, feel free to rip it apart or whatever you want. But you can probably trace the electrical circuitry to try to understand what the coil is. You'll see at these terminals, you see uh, the electrical wire that's just braided in copper, and then it goes and it is actually attached to this speaker cone, and you can also see where the, in the center here, you'll see where the uh, wire is sticking through, and it just goes to a coil. So just like we have coils that are moving iron transducers, solenoids, we have coils in here as well. This one just happens to be covered up with a little piece of cloth, which I thought I'll just take off here in a second. So second observation. This is coiled wire. in a circle, uh, and this is connected to the speaker cone. Okay, so the speaker cone is this black thing you see here. Right? This is what actually moves. This is what moves the air, which then creates a pressure wave, which is then how your ears hear sound. Um, other observation is that this has, and you, if you pull this out, you'll see that there's this kind of cloth like structure that's just pleated, and that creates a spring like action to this. So if I push it, it springs back. If I push out, it returns back to its neutral position. So there is not like a spring like you would see in a, like in a, like a closing door mechanism, but there is something that acts something like a spring. It returns it to its neutral position. So spring like mechanism. In the coil or in the cone. And I say I guess att attached to cone is probably the better word to, way to say it. Okay. Next thing is movement. So just like uh, just like with the solenoid, we have this voltage supply. Check that down. Okay, so this voltage supply is just a variable voltage supply it allows you to change the voltage being applied to the circuit. So I'm going to connect these leads to the two terminals in the back, which then leads to the coil. And 
those of you in the back, you may not be able to see this too well. So, but those are punched, you'll see it. So right now I'm sending zero volts to this. And I'm going to increase the voltage. And so those in the front, maybe I'll see it, but as I increase the voltage, you may notice that this speaker, this cone is actually retracting or it's actually going towards me. More. It's not going to move much because I've, just, I've, I've bottomed out. Let me decrease that. And let me drive it the other way. So we got to change polarity here. I was seeing something when I said this is retracting. I need to get a better speaker. <laughs> Slightly less more jump than this. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I had, I had another one and it, it showed up missing when I went to look for speakers in the department. So, alright. I'll find one that works and we'll do an actual demonstration on Wednesday. It actually should move. Find one that works. I'll still pass it around and we'll go through more applications on uh, the class. So we'll just hold off from those observations and get to some of the uh, the other ones that are that we can use from the observations thus far. All right. <clears throat> Okay, so before we start to go through these, the speaker and analyze some of the things, um, let's review some things. Um, so a moving charge. Um, like a current. Can create a force. All right, so this should be, um, this is some of the really initial discussions we had in the previous, on the previous lecture, but just for a quick review here, if we have a B field or magnetic field, given by B, and we have some sort of charged particle, with velocity u. Um, then we have a force, and this force is given by the right-hand rule. It's going to be perpendicular, uh, mutually perpendicular to these two two fields here. And this is given by F is equal to Q, U, uh, I forgot B. QUB sine theta. All right, so theta is the angle between the B field and U. All right, so if the velocity of this particle is going along the direction of the B field, the force is going to be zero, because sine of zero is zero, and you get maximum amount of force when the uh, particle is moving with a velocity perpendicular to this B field. Right? And as we see, as we look at more and more uh, electromechanical machines, engineers are pretty good at this. They find ways to make sure that whatever is moving is actually moving in terms of current, is actually going perpendicular to the B field as best possible to try and get the maximum amount of force out of it. So that's 
So going along this idea here, if we can create a really simple motor and try to understand how the system works, what we have here is I have some sort of structure. It is conductive. And I have then this rail. All right, so we have conductive cage. We also have a conducting member that can slide left or right. And I have a B field going into the page everywhere. So I denote this by X's, right? This is saying that the B field is like a bunch of arrows being directed into the page. All right. And so then the last thing I do is I somehow create a current via some sort of current supply. And this current is running through this, this member that can move. So we have a current I running through here, and then it's going to take the path of least resistance, so it's going to go around this fixed structure. So the structure on the outside is fixed. This piece in the middle contacts the edges of the structure, but can move left to right. right? So this is kind of a simple thought experiment. So then the question is, given this current with its direction, and this B field, what is the direction of the force on this moving member here? What would we get? Yes, Carl. Uh, what do you mean by outwards? To the left, okay. So, yeah, so if we look at this in terms of the right hand rule, we have current, that's all, right? So we then have force a So what we've made here is a really, really simple motor, right? And we'll talk about more complicated motors uh, later, but this is just kind of a thought experiment in terms of where the forces are here. But we have a mechanism by putting a current through this bar, or you can also think of this as a coil if, if you want, and we'll get into coils in a second, and having a some sort of magnetic field, we can generate motion, right, with this. Uh, I'm going to skip a, li a little bit of details and notes and get to the main point here and what's something called the Bly Law. So those of you from back from your physics classes, you've probably heard of the Bly Law. And so this is that this force is equal to B times the, the length of this member times the current times sine theta. Um, like I said before, a lot of electromechanical machines are designed such that this theta is equal to pi over 2, because that's when you get the most amount of force. So often we will simplify this. Simplify it by to B. F is equal to B L I. Law. Okay, so I'm out of time. Um, on Wednesday's class, we'll go through this a little bit more, and then we'll also get into the blue law, which is looking at the electromotive force, which is how generators work. So we'll talk about that on Wednesday. Any questions in this last minute on what we talked about today? Okay, we'll have a better demonstration on Wednesday. If I can find a speaker, I will not take one out of my car just to prove a point. <laughs> Perfect.